Democrats may have agreed with Ambassador Bolton on some issues, uh, for example, withdrawing the United States from the Iran nuclear deal, as you point out, and as the president pointed out uh, in his tweet, uh, those disagreements uh, may have numbered uh, en enormously. Uh, well, so let me just, Paula, if you're just um, probably reading this, you're on the air, so you're yes. not seeing this. John oh, Bolton, oh, you just saw Bolton's tweet? <laughs> Eyes in the back of my head, Vlad, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah, so let me just read for our audience. Uh, Ambassador Bolton tweeted this just moments ago. I offered to resign last night, and President Trump said, let's talk about it tomorrow. So um, a little bit of a contradiction, I guess. Uh, uh, because the president says in a tweet that he fired Bolton. Um, so anyway, so that's what the, the ambassador has just tweeted. Uh, I offered to resign last night. President Trump said, let's talk about it tomorrow. Um, look, it's true that whilst the president may have agreed with Bolton on some issues, Paul, as you know, he came into office essentially not really being a... a a war hawk the way John Bolton is known as a war hawk. Uh, president, right. president wanting to, uh, from the very beginning uh, when he started running for president to remove the United States, for example, from the war in Afghanistan, um, something that perhaps uh, he clashed with Ambassador Bolton on and a number of other issues. That's right, and particularly when it comes to Afghanistan, President Trump is not the first president who had to grapple with this. His two predecessors also were vexed by this issue of how to draw down our true commitment in Afghanistan. And I think the president is seeing just how difficult it is to deliver on that promise to get out of these, quote, pointless foreign wars. And there were some people, including the president, who were a little bit concerned that Ambassador Bolton may be too much of a hawk, may want to engage in wars when they were not necessary and certainly not popular with the president's supporters. But it's also good to have a variety of different opinions around you, particularly when you're dealing with these complicated foreign policy issues. The president is not a career a diplomat nor a career politician. Uh, so someone like Ambassador Bolton, even if you don't agree with his approach, he brings to the table decades of experience. But he was a known quantity. The president knew who he was getting. He knew the perspective he was getting. But the two just did not see eye to eye as the president seeks to avoid foreign entanglement and also, as the president has indicated with Russia and North Korea, try to get along with our adversaries. And I think the president has seen, particularly with Russia and North Korea, Afghanistan as well, Iran, it's not that easy to make friends with some of these countries. And if you do so, you, there are there are traps, there are pitfalls. You know, the question, of course, uh, becomes Paula. I mean, this is a big deal because this is a really important position, but there are a number of open positions still in the Trump cabinet. Uh, there are a number of individuals who still have the title interim uh, in mm -hmm. their titles, including Mick Mulvaney, the chief of staff, yeah. who's still an interim chief of staff. I mean, this sort exactly. of just adds to the number of people that, and, uh, you know, we can ask our, our producers to check what the number is of people who have left this, left this administration uh, in two years, but also the vac uh, vacancies that continue to exist in the Trump administration. Exactly. I also just want to notify our viewers that that noise that you hear, that is construction noise. They are working on another kind of wall here at the White House. They are expanding uh, the fence. So that's the noise you hear here at the White House. But exactly, the president has said that he kind of likes keeping people in acting roles. For example, as chief of staff, he prefers it that way. Uh, he thinks it keeps them on their toes. It also makes them easier to replace. He doesn't have to go through any rigmarole, not necessarily the chief of staff, but with other uh, positions having to go through Senate confirmation in some instances. But there are some roles, uh, for example, Attorney General, Deputy Attorney General, Revive. You need you need these people to be confirmed so that they have their full Paula, powers. Paula, just give me one yep. second. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got uh, uh, former CIA Director John uh, Brennan speaking, uh, looks like at the University of Texas. Let's just hear what he has to say. I do hope that we're going to have uh, leaders and officials who are able to fulfill their responsibilities ably, nobly, and uh, with uh, the experience that I think is required at this uh, challenging time. If the call came, would you take the job? <laughs> I, I served for over 33 years, not as long as Bill, 37 years, but I have done my part. My effort now is trying to encourage young students to seriously consider a role in national security. Thank you, sir. I'll pose that same thing, but they're dominating. Well, I'm sorry again. Um, what your, what's your assessment in regards to right, right now, the situation that we have in national security and, and, and the situation in flux in the White House, a lot of criticism, a lot of um, um, doubt uh, in how we handled the situation. How do we move forward? How do we get beyond this? You know, uh, I have been really lucky to have served with uh, everybody on on this uh, uh, on this stage, if you will, um, learning a lot from their experience and understanding how important it is to have steady leadership and to have visionary leadership. 
uh, and the kind of uh, impactful assessment of threats that are coming. So uh, one of the things that I look at, the lens that I look at, is obviously through the soft power piece. Uh, I want to see people who are coming into government, both at state and at the NSC, who are uh, interested in all of the tools in our toolbox and learning how to apply them. Uh, the 21st century threats are very different than anything that we could have uh, expected, the rate and the pace that they're going forward. So um, what I would love to see is the next generation of leaders that come in, serving this president and the presidents that come after, um, to be engaging and malleable and thought-provoking uh, in the way in which they assess uh, what, what is possible. Before the information that just broke uh, in the last 24 hours, the big discussion was the Taliban. And, and when is the right time to bring them to the table? Is there a right time to bring that group to the table? Well, speaking personally, in my own view, it's, it's been apparent now for a number of years that there is no military solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. I think that has been uh, demonstrated over the course of quite a number of years now that neither the Taliban nor the coalition is going to achieve military dominance to the point that the conflict would end that way. And so that leaves you um, with a negotiated outcome as probably the best and only solution to solving this problem. All right, so uh, we just cut away to that panel, which is a panel being held at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where you just saw former CIA Director John Brennan, uh, Admiral, retired Admiral William McRaven, who was a former uh, commander in special operations, U.S. special operations, along with Farrah Pandith, uh, uh, a number of individuals who have national security uh, uh, credentials in their background and their experience talking about the breaking news, which is that the President of the United States, if you are going by what the President says, uh, fired his national security advisor, John Bolton. Uh, if you are going by what uh, Ambassador Bolton has just tweeted, uh, he says he offered to resign and that the president said, let's talk about it tomorrow, meaning today. Uh, Paul Reed is standing by at the White House. Uh, we're going to also try to get uh, Christina Ruffini, our State Department reporter, up to talk about this because Christina has sent us some uh, nuggets that we should point out to our, our viewers. But, Paula, uh, so I, I just wanted to double check with our producers in the control room that I was reading these tweets accurately. The President of the United States saying he fired Ambassador Bolton, Ambassador Bolton saying he offered to resign last night. So there's clearly a discrepancy there. Very clearly a discrepancy there. We're actually getting some new reporting uh, from our, our reporter here, uh, Katie Watson. She's running around the White House talking to some folks. And remember the White House spokeswoman, Stephanie Grisham, said the breaking point with Ambassador Bolton was not just this meeting with the Taliban at, at Camp David. Officially, the White House is saying it was many, many issues. Katie is also hearing from her sources that Bolton is no longer here on the White House grounds. That's significant, Vlad, because there are about mm, two dozen reporters uh, hovering here if he was to walk by <laughs> wanting to hear his story, but it appears that instead he's using Twitter to give his side of the story, insisting, as you noted, that he resigned last night. He was not fired. So it's, and of course, Paula, I mean, Look, the news that the ambassador is no longer part of this administration is huge news. The, the, the challenge, I think, for you, other reporters, for us, is what's the truth here? Because you've got two individuals, uh, you, you know, it's telling their side of the story, and it's, it's hard to know if we'll ever really know what actually happened. What, was the ambassador fired, or did he offer to resign uh, last night uh, over these disagreements that the president says that they've had over, over time? And I, I guess that's the challenge challenge for all of you who are part of the White House press corps. Every day of my life, Vlad, it becomes a he said, he said. And look, there's no legal standard for, well, did you resign or get fired if you offered your resignation and the president didn't get back to you and then tweeted that you were fired? What is clear here, though, is that there were actual fundamental policy disagreements. We're getting more information in from our producer, Sarah Cook. Uh, in Arden Farhi, they're reporting that sources are telling them that the secure, National Security Council and the White House have effectively operated as separate entities hmm. uh, since John Bolton came in. We have certainly seen that, uh, again, in policy, in these disagreements over how to handle these key foreign policy issues. Uh, their sources are telling them that this was true even back when General Kelly uh, was the chief of staff. They're saying that John Bolton operated separately, separately and distinctly uh, from the White House. Uh, he often, according to their sources, didn't attend meetings and followed his own initiatives. He was running his own show, something that is a cardinal sin here at the Trump White House. Make no mistake about who is in charge, uh, who gets the credit, who gets really to, to have all the sunshine and, and all the say. It's Trump's White House, and anyone who runs afoul of that 
will find themselves fired yeah, or resigning. Uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, look, uh, I'm looking at uh, a piece filed by Peter Baker, a White House correspondent for The New York Times. Uh, and in his reporting, he says at one point, military officials expressed alarm at Mr. Bolton's request for contingency war plans. Now, uh, I find that really interesting. I know our Christina Rafiti is reporting that uh, Ambassador Bolton and the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also clashed on a number, oh, yes. on a range of issues. Absolutely. She's completely right, particularly on the issue of North Korea with Bolton's perspective and Bolton's approach eventually getting edged out uh, by the ambitious Secretary of State. Again, Mike Pompeo, though, is also particularly more uh, politically adept, uh, understands the president perhaps a little bit better and is willing to do things his way, perhaps why he has been so successful and lasted so long in this administration. So, Paula, do you remember uh, when the ambassador, John Bolton, uh, joined the Trump administration, what the president said at the time? I'm trying to remember as we as we try to process this breaking news, because it wasn't as if, uh, you know, there were certainly concerns leading up to the decision for the president to ask the ambassador to join um, yeah. uh, the administration and and people uh, I remember I seem to recall a lot of people saying President Trump's not going to do it but then he did you recall mm -hmm. what president said as to the reason why he wanted ambassador Bolton to be part of his administration I do not remember what the president said at the time, but yeah. John Bolton is a known entity within Washington. He's made no secret uh, of his his worldview, of his approach to a lot of these issues. So there were many folks who were surprised when they brought him in because, again, as you noted, he is, is more hawkish. He brings a very clear-eyed, arguably skeptical view of many of our adversaries, which is very different than what the president has promised his supporters and the country he would be doing related to our adversaries. He says, quote, it would be great if we could get along with Russia or North Korea. He's made overtures uh, about this with Iran and most recently even inviting the Taliban to Camp David. Look, this is this is not the John Bolton playbook. So I think people were surprised when they brought him brought him on. Yeah, um, and of course, uh, there were a number of members of the president's own party, Republicans, who were not happy uh, that the president was inclined to invite the Taliban to Camp David uh, uh, just a couple of days away from the anniversary of 9-11. Of now, I, I note that uh, former Secretary of State uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice was here uh, at CBS this morning, um, and she mentioned that at Camp David, Camp David had in the past hosted uh, individuals and organizations organizations that uh, perhaps the American people did not have much liking for, including mm -hmm. uh, the PLO leader Yasser Arafat during the Camp David agreements that ultimately led to peace between uh, uh, Israel and, uh, and uh, excuse me, Egypt and, um, and Israel. Uh, there was a, but there have been a bunch of unsavory characters that have, that have appeared, um, sure, uh, yeah. you know, in the United States. Uh, but, uh, but, but this was perhaps something else that uh, the ambassador and President Trump clashed on. Absolutely. And it really speaks to the difference between their strategies. The president, as he said just, just yesterday, speaking to, to reporters when, when he was leaving for North Carolina, he said he wanted to talk. He believed war was not the answer. And in order to extract the U.S. from these kinds of endless engagements, he said he wanted to negotiate. He said, look, the Taliban, what's wrong with bringing them there if I can save American lives? He did not get any questions uh, about why he would bring them there so close to the anniversary uh, of 9-11. But this is something that Ambassador Bolton did not think was a good idea. Again, while the president seems to favor uh, negotiations to work through these differences with our adversaries, Bolton tended to err more on the side of military intervention, something more aggressive, defensive, uh, less collaborative, shall we say. Mm. All right, Paula, stand by. Uh, I'll give you a chance to digest the emails <laughs> and uh, anybody who you may be talking to in the White House. Uh, stand by while we bring on a CBS News State Department and Foreign Affairs reporter, Christina Ruffini. She's going to join us uh, and talk to me uh, over the telephone. Um, so, so Ruffini, I was just pointing out to to Paula that uh, that this this these secret Taliban talks that the president uh, canceled because of the attack on on uh, a, a wedding that ultimately one American soldier was killed at a couple of days ago um, in Afghanistan was the reason the president cited for not hosting the Taliban at Camp David. I was pointing out that Condi Rice, and I was sort of digesting everything, uh, pointed out that at Camp David there had been a lot of unsavory people during the Camp David Accords. Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat tried to hammer out a peace. Uh, Yasser Arafat was there when uh, President Bill Clinton was trying to hammer out a, a deal between uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis. So it's not as if uh, that hadn't happened before we had some unsavory people at Camp David, but was what are you hearing about Ambassador Bolton and his position on those secret talks that the president was planning on having with the Taliban? 
Well, Ambassador Bolton has always been more hawkish than some other members of the administration, right? So Secretary Pompeo, um, you know, uh, the lead negotiator, Zane Kalazat, works for the State Department, right? He works under the Secretary of State, which is Mike Pompeo. And it has been their opinion that, you know, everybody wants out of the war, but you've got to do it smartly. And the way to do that is to have these talks. There have been nine rounds of talks. They've been going on for months. And the fear was always a little bit that, you know, the president would get impatient and pull the plug at the last minute and it would all be for naught. But they seemed to be going well. They had initialed the framework of an agreement and then came this idea to bring them to Camp David. Um, now, as you said, there have been unsavory characters at Camp David. There have been people who people consider terrorists at Camp David. It was a couple things. First of all, you know, it was having them here within days of them killing an American soldier on the anniversary, the week of 9-11. You know, those optics are really hard to surmount, even if you do negotiate this deal, because you have to think about what kind of a deal it is, right? It's not a peace accord. The Taliban had never agreed to a permanent ceasefire throughout these negotiations. So it would have been the signing of agreement, but then you still have to go back and have an entire another round of peace talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government. So it wouldn't have even really settled anything. And I think that's why it was it was so controversial to begin with. And it might have just blown open these long simmering divisions between Bolton, who is who was more aggressive and and less for diplomacy and more for. U.S. getting involved where it needed to get involved, including in places like Venezuela and Pompeo, who left so. Hang on one second, Christina, um, just because uh, I know Paula has got to run, uh, so I just want to get one more question, or at least uh, Paula's thoughts before she does uh, head out um, and continue the reporting on the breaking news, if you're just joining us, which is uh, that depending on who you believe, the president of the United States says he fired uh, his national security advisor, John Bolton. Ambassador Bolton tweeted that he offered to resign last night. Uh, so, Paula, um, we're, what's next, I guess? We're going to have to find what's another NSA official, an, an, another head of the NSA. And it doesn't seem in two years into this administration that there might be a lot of takers out there, at least of the caliber that we've had historically in the United States. Well, you never know. He has been able to find some pretty high caliber people to fill jobs. For example, Jeff Sessions' successor, or William Barr, uh, even though we've sparred his press conferences, he is clearly qualified. He's someone of the highest caliber. You never know who wants to come in and try to serve this administration. But the president will need to look now for another uh, national security advisor. And right now it's not clear who that will be, but the president is making it clear. He does not agree with Bolton's worldview. The fundamental differences on how to engage our adversaries, and that should inform folks on how the president will spend the rest of this term, perhaps the next one with his approach to Afghanistan, Iran, North Korea, and, and of course, Russia. All right. Paula Reed for us at the White House. Paula, thank you so much. I know it's kind of crazy today, right now. And <laughs> every you were day, able, Vlad. I know, every day. <laughs> but you scrambling uh, to the camera and coming up for us to uh, share what you know with our audience, uh, we greatly appreciate it as always. Thank you so much. Of course. All right, let's go back to Christina Ruffini, who's our State Department reporter. She's still on the phone with us uh, to talk about all of this. Um, so, Ruffini, as you just heard uh, Paula saying, the, the reality is that uh, although the president did ask the ambassador to join the administration and uh, become the head of the NSA, he'd always uh, had some fundamental disagreements. So the question that Paula and I were sort of bantering about was, why did he even want Bolton in the administration if there were so many issues that they fundamentally disagreed on? I think it, it was an ethos. You know, they, they both were very strong on America first and, uh, you know, this, this image of America around the world and strength and, you know, kind of an unapologetic foreign policy. I think that's what they had in common. Um, but, you know, Washington is a rumor mill, but there are rumors from the beginning that Trump has had problems with him. You know, he, everything from he, you know, the president likes to get out of wars. Bolton tends to want to get involved, not necessarily in wars, but in military action. And all the way from, you know, very serious issues like that to I heard someone say just yesterday that he hates his mustache and complains about it all the time. Um, right. I remember so that. It's, you know, the president is very big on people looking the part. And, um, and Bolton, in his opinion, according to various people, take that with a grain of salt, it didn't look the part. But they did have enough in common, especially at the onset, that he thought he would be uh, a good national security advisor. And look, Bolton was a loyal soldier. I think for the most part he tried to carry out what he thought the president wanted or what he thought the president should want and was in the best interest of this very hawkish American first foreign policy. I know with Venezuela, um, you know, he had been the one pushing for more military intervention and to be tougher on Maduro and things like that. 
whereas others were saying, like, you know, let's wait a minute, let's try more sanctions, let's, let's try diplomacy, let's, let's see if there are other ways to go about this before we invest more American blood and treasure in another place, uh, you know, around the world. You know, it's interesting, too, Christina, um, you know, as we try to uh, recall, you know, how the ambassador came uh, to be named the NSA director, uh, it was after the Department of General H.R. McMaster, you'll recall, uh, that a lot of people back then, uh, when H.R. McMaster uh, was NSA director, sort of credited him as being sort of a moderating force on the president. But the reality seems to be that uh, the president was a moderating force on himself, and it was Ambassador Bolton who was coming to the table with some very, 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 as you point out, hawkish views on a number of issues. Um, the title of his book, Rafini, was Surrender is Not an Option. Right. You know, he's not, he's, he's not, a, not a timid figure, and he's a <laughs> controversial figure, but you can't, you can't say he's not clear about his views, and he is, for the most part, predictable and, and a constant, which in foreign policy can't be a good thing. At least for the most part, you knew where John Bolton was coming from, right? He was for American right. values, American ideals. But he was no also and, the cost, and, and get one in of the, there, get it done. And one of the things you you mentioned is this this relationship that he uh, had or did not have, I guess, with uh, the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Mike Pompeo is more in line, or at least uh, appears to be more in line with the president's views on a number of issues, as you are aware. He appeared on Face the Nation this weekend with Margaret Brennan, and he was basically in lockstep with the president on almost everything that he and Margaret talked about. Um, I know through your reporting that he and uh, Ambassador Bolton did not have the, the greatest of relationships. And part of that is sort of what you're saying, which is that Ambassador Bolton had this America first mentality, and he sort of had a, dis a disdain for international diplomacy, which is, of course, the job of the Secretary of State. Well, the interesting dichotomy there is Bolton hates international, you know, multilateralism, right? He hates these big, you know, giant, unwieldy alliances and all these things that he thinks get in, gets in the way of America doing what it needs to do. President Trump, in general, feels the same way about those organizations. However, where they differ is President Trump has held back in getting involved in a couple places that I think Ambassador Bolton would have liked America to be more hands-in. Venezuela, again, comes to mind. So, they were aligned ideologically, but when it came to the practicality of putting American troops in harm's way, it was the president who I think uh, was more reticent to do that. And that's more in line with Secretary Pompeo as well. You know, Secretary Pompeo went to West Point. He served uh, overseas uh, during the Cold War. He knows what it's like to be one of those guys on the front lines. And I think that makes a difference when you are talking about deploying people kids and American citizens over to fight foreign wars because we've had a long history of that. I mean, Afghanistan is a, is a perfect example. It's been 18 years and mm. we're still there. Mm. You know, um, it was only a few months after he became NSA director that the president uh, declared that he was withdrawing the United States from the Iran nuclear deal. And of course, that was seen as a signature uh, foreign policy achievement under uh, his predecessor, Barack Obama, President Barack Obama. Um, it, there was a sense clearly that Ambassador Bolton was against the deal even when uh, President Obama was pushing for it. And perhaps with joining the administration, this gave the president the, the final license or the final push that he needed to finally remove the United States So uh, from that deal. So it does seem I, I, on Iran, they agreed on a number of issues, but it seems like what you're saying with a number of other uh, hot spots around the world that they had some deep disagreements. I think Iran is one of the places they did see eye to eye, yeah. and I think that goes back to, uh, you know, Ambassador Bolton has a close relationship with Israel and uh, on policy. And, and you know, the, the word with the JCPOA was the president wanted to pull out right away, but there were people in his administration, especially at the start of the administration, as you know, that were a bit more moderate and had kind of talked him down and said, you know, just wait, just wait, because it did take, you know, a year or so for him to pull out of that agreement. And the timing is a bit precipitous, right? John Bolton comes in, and all of a sudden, you know, JCPOA is toast. It's the war. He just said during the campaign trail, it's the worst agreement. We should get out of it. We should get out of it. But there had been enough voices in the room saying there are big repercussions to this. Let's walk it slowly. Let's not do this. Now, that's not to say that other people in the administration are any lighter on Iran. I mean, it's 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 part of the Mike Pompeo drinking game, right? You know, Iran needs to return to the the twelve things that he's laid out for them to become a normal country. You know, Iran is a state sponsor of terror. This is a refrain we hear over and over and over and over again at the State Department. 
Um, so I think I think they have that in common that, that they want to be really tough on Iran, that they want to be very good allies to Israel, that there is no daylight between maybe even all three of them, the president, John Bolton, and Secretary Pompeo, when it came to the Iran policy. It was those other policies that started to show some cracks. And eventually, with these two men jostling for power, it seems that Mike Pompeo has come out on on top as the uncontested survivor of a Trump administration cabinet official. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was reporting uh, over the weekend, Christina, as you know, uh, that as the president was preparing for this high stakes meeting with Taliban officials, uh, uh, that uh, that uh, up until leading up until this weekend, that uh, Bolton was not always featured in those meetings that the president was having on trying to deal with the situation in Afghanistan, that he was increasingly sidelined uh, from any kind of negotiation. Uh, even before this this sort of so-called secret meeting, the president had been talking to officials in Afghanistan uh, about figuring out a way to finally end uh, America's involvement in our longest war, and that Bolton was more or less sidelined, that this was the president of the United States, this was other national security officials uh, and defense officials and the secretary of state, Mike Pompeo. Um, but that Ambassador Bolton was uh, increasingly sidelined because, as we've been discussing, um, he disagreed with the president's uh, uh, rationale for withdrawing the United States or removing the United States uh, from Afghanistan. Um, and, and the president has been very vocal, going back to when he was campaigning for the office, that he did not want the United States to continue in Afghanistan. Well, and my understanding was he disagreed with the idea of talking to the Taliban. You know, it was more of a, if you're going to get out, get out. But there's no reason to, to try to have these talks for whatever reason. He just had, he had been not a proponent of these negotiations with the Taliban, which in his defense are controversial and wrought with flaws. And a lot of people on both sides of the aisle have, have problems with them. So that's not necessarily, a, you know, he's not alone. Bolton wasn't alone in disagreeing with this approach. However, um, you know, for whatever reason, I don't have particular insight into how involved he was in this decision over the weekend. But I can say that would that would fit with some of the things we've been hearing about um, who's making these decisions and who's in the meetings and who's not. So, uh, uh, Christine, I just want to share um, from our White House reporter, Catherine Watson, some more information that she's sending us right now. Uh, uh, Stephanie Grisham, uh, the White House communications director slash press secretary, uh, has told the reporters uh, that the president did ask for Ambassador Bolton's resignation last night, and it was delivered today. Uh, she didn't go into any possible replacements. Uh, I guess she was asked whether there was one final last straw that broke the camel's back, and she says there was not. Uh, she did say that there might be a resignation a resignation letter that uh, is made available to to the press, um, and uh, she confirms that Ambassador Bolton isn't there today. Uh, and there is a 1:30 briefing, uh, and I'm not clear as, as to uh, which briefing that is. If it's a if it's a press briefing or if it's a, a State Department briefing, it's, is it a State uh, Department? My understanding is that it is it is a briefing uh, with Secretary Pompeo and some other figures at the White House to talk about new sinks and new powers. Now earlier. In the day, we had been told that Bolton might be at that press conference, but I'm assuming he will be elsewhere now. Uh, so, sorry, Christina, one more time. Did you say that there is a State Department briefing, or what, what is that 1.30 briefing? Uh, it, it's at the White House. The Secretary, uh, uh, where it will be um, other players will be at the White House Got giving it. a briefing, I, I believe, about sanctions. And we've heard that Ambassador Bolton might have been at that briefing, but we're assuming now he will be elsewhere. Got it, got it, got it. Um, so, Christina, the other uh, sort of interesting uh, question around all of this in national security and diplomacy um, is North Korea, right? North Korea just again recently fired more missiles uh, into the sky. Uh, the president in the past, in the last couple of weeks, has said he's okay with that. He doesn't feel that North Korea is violating the terms of their agreement. Uh, where did, I mean, I, I don't even know if we've gotten any word from Pompeo or the State Department today on, as to the most recent firing uh, missile fires, uh, but where was Pompeo on, on North Korea and where was Bolton? I'm just seeking to sort of shed some light on some of those disagreements uh, that the two may have, because I sort of see Pompeo as also a proxy for the president, given that they're more in lockstep over many issues. Well, if you want to read the tea leaves, which at this point is a full-time occupation to these tea leaves, it, I mean, you could look at that meeting at the DMZ and notice very conspicuously who wasn't there, mm. and that's the National Security Advisor. Yeah, that's a good. That's, that, that's <laughs> sorry, a good. I've got some people calling me while I'm while I'm talking to you on the phone. Yeah, no, that's um, I totally understand. 
Go ahead. You were saying that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that Bolton was not at that uh, that DMZ uh, meeting. Actually, Vlad, I'm so sorry. I have I have to take this call. Okay, you this do that. You do that, Christina. About, so I'm going to have to go. All right, you thank do that. You so that much. that is the yeah. Thank you very much for calling in, uh, Christina. We appreciate it. that's Christina Ruffini, our State Department reporter, uh, who graciously called in to us uh, in the midst of this breaking news, uh, which we greatly appreciate. As Christina is probably getting uh, calls left, right, and center, uh, she took some time out to uh, walk us through this. Again, if you're just joining us here at CBSN, uh, the breaking news out of Washington. In D.C. from the Twitter account of the President of the United States. The President of the United States says via Twitter that he has fired the National Security Advisor John Bolton. I'm going to read you the tweet from the President that came out moments ago. I informed John Bolton last night that his services are no longer needed at the White House. I disagreed strongly with many of his suggestions, as did others in the administration, and therefore I asked John for his resignation, which was given to me this morning. I thank John very much for his service. I will be naming a new National Security Advisor next week. Stephanie Grisham, the president's communications director, was asked who that person might possibly be. Uh, she did not indicate um, that uh, that uh, there was somebody uh, yet uh, in mind as, as far as an acting national security advisor, but the president's saying he'll have someone um, named by next week. Meanwhile, Ambassador John Bolton, uh, very quickly after the president tweeted, um, tweeted his own uh, version of events, if you will, and he tweeted this, I offered to resign last night, and the president said, let's talk about it tomorrow. So, contradiction from the Trump White House. We're going to try to get to the bottom of it, try to dig into it. You can see we have two of our great reporters, Paula Reed and Christina Ruffini, working with us on this. Uh, we are going to get Paula back again at the top of the hour, where she'll join my colleague, Rena Nyden, to take you through all the ins and outs of the breaking news coming out of Washington. Thank you very much for hanging out with me. We're going to take a quick break. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on.
Turning now to North Carolina, where voters are heading to the polls for today's closely watched special election. Democrat Dan McCready is facing, off, is facing off against Republican Dan Bishop. McCready lost to Republican Mark Harris by 905 votes in November, but state officials ordered a new election over allegations of fraud. Harris announced in February that he wouldn't participate in the special election. And President Trump actually held a rally in North Carolina last night to support Bishop, though Many see today's election as a referendum on the president and an indicator of what's to come nationwide in 2020. The National Rifle Association is suing the city of San Francisco after the city's board of supervisors labeled it a domestic terrorist organization. San Francisco Supervisor Catherine Stefan